The following is an address by Linda O'Brien, CEO of South Carolina ETV at the Convergence and Society Conference at the University of South Carolina on September 28, 2012. Thanks so much, Charles. Uh, it is just a delight to be here. I'm just sorry I missed the dancing portion of the program, <laughs> but maybe somebody tweeted that out somewhere. But we really appreciate um, all that you're doing to host this conference. Thanks to Augie. Thanks to Rob Wells. Uh, this is a great theme that you have to talk about business news and also convergence and society. Um, convergence is so much a part of what we do every day in media. It's how we access, how we disseminate information um, on multiple platforms, and it seems like there's a new platform every day. And it's hard to keep up with all of this. That's why I don't tweet so much, Charles, because <laughs> there are so many competing demands on, on one's time. I remember growing up, as I'm sure some of you did, and I'm dating myself now, but um, growing up with basically watching three network newscasts. And we had two newspapers, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. We had two newspapers, and my grandmother liked business news and always got the Wall Street Journal, and then a few magazines in the mix. But that was really it. That was our stream of news that came into the household. And when you think about it, most of the readers, viewers, listeners, um, all got their news from one of four or five sources. And many of those sources were very similar. Many of those um, news organizations had similar editorial policies, similar <coughs> focus. Um, the the 6.30 news was, or 7 o'clock news was must watch viewing. And when we think about it today, the paradigm has totally changed and we are much more segmented and much more specialized. And it's ironic to me that convergence is actually leading to divergence when it comes to how people consume media. So on cable, you can watch 24-7 sports, m multiple sports channels, music, food. There's now even a new channel for soap operas. So you, you have your choices. You have many choices. And you find like-minded people who watch those segmented uh, choices. You can customize your Twitter feed and only get the news that you want to get. You can dis determine what videos you want to watch by your friends' likes on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not recommending that, but some people do it. Um, very few programs, very few programs or events are watched by all of us, and even fewer all of us at one time. Convergence and the ability to digitize multiple streams is really fueling all of this. The technology is, is, has totally changed the media industry. We hear about disruptive technology. It is here and it is changing all of us every day. So when you look at business and economic news, it is a perfect time to be doing, to be talking about it in classrooms, to be producing business news, to be creating business news because this is an interesting um, topic. It's really a niche market in some regards, but it's also a mainstream market. And why do I say that? Well, think about it. The November election is just about 39 days away from today. And in the past year, we have seen almost daily headlines about the economy. So it's the unemployment rate, it's global trade, it's the soft recovery, outsourcing of jobs, and on and on. In fact, some pundits are saying the presidential election will be won by two factors, the likability factor or the economy. I'm not sure which one will emerge, but I do know that the economy is driving the conversation of our viewers and our listeners and our online users. And so that conversation needs to be part of what we do. And it's important because the public really needs to understand this stuff. I, I sat in for a little bit of, of the earlier panel, which was fascinating, talking about the Federal Reserve. And there's some really complicated issues that come out of business news that as journalists, it's really important that we're able to explain and make relevant for a mass wide audience. Because now more than ever, people are, they have their own 401ks, they're managing their budgets. They need to know this information and understand it. So I, I really believe that one of the most important missions that we have as journalists is providing context and understanding. 
And that's why I believe that it's important for managing editors, news directors, um, others to develop at least a business beat, if not a whole section. In my career, I've worked in both general and specialized news, and I have seen firsthand the value of a beat, especially with today's trends toward convergence. And business news is not easy to explain. It has its own vocabulary. Not too long ago, talking about the Federal Reserve, we were hearing all about QE1 and then QE2 and QE3, and no, this wasn't the Queen Elizabeth, this wasn't a new cruise ship. But if you weren't really paying attention, you would hear that, you'd hear it flash on the radio or a tweet and say, what is the QE? Quantitative easing. Well, so it's incumbent upon the business journalists to explain that and what that means and what that means for monetary policy, interest rates, and ultimately what it might mean for your mortgage interest rate or your loan. Making that connection between macroeconomics and personal finance is really what business journalists need to do and what we're all about. So perusing the, the Wall Street Journal this week, you find terms like VC, PE ratio, GDP, on and on. I remember a time when we used terms and regularly like white knight, poison pill, LBO. You don't hear those so much anymore. And I think business news, like a lot of things, like styles, goes through trends. And um, these words, these acronyms, become part of our lexicon. And, um, and so like sports, and I'm not really, a, I don't follow sports that much, but there's a language to it. And so learning that language and understanding it and being able to communicate it is important for today's business news journalist. And then it's, it's important to not just think about one story. Um, so if you were writing about QE3, that one story might end up on the front page of your newspaper. It might be in a blog. It probably will be in a tweet because you want the word to get out that it's there and a longer form exists somewhere else or on Facebook or as an online interview just to mention a few ways that one story might be disseminated um, all over literally in all these different methods and that's really the beauty of convergence that you have those tools and you can do that but then technology allows the greater customization so users can take in that content at their own pace so watching that network news and I used to think of the network news as sort of the TV hearth that's where the family would gather around and watch the news together or watch a program that just doesn't happen anymore uh, but people can read what they want to read or watch and then drill down and get more. And so for us in the industry, there's this great opportunity to create these verticals of content where the user can, can gain increasing levels of knowledge and drill down further. And the other part of convergence that I find so interesting is that you do attract like-minded users. So certain sites, and we're finding this even in some of the work that we do with Facebook, uh, will ignite a conversation, other sites won't, and I don't know how that works exactly, but there are just certain users who find an affinity talking to other users. So that's another choice, that if you offer social media, you can get people talking to each other. And in a way, because of all of this, technology has helped to demystify this topic of business news that's so critical to everyone in America. And it's a topic that um, we need to continue focusing on because it is such an important part. I talked about the presidential elections, but you think about some of the, the pocketbook issues for people at different ages of their lives, and it's critically important. So in, five, in the next five years, nearly 50% of the population will be 50 years or older. And that group, my group, the baby boomers, will have purse strings on 70% of disposable income. That's a huge and large group. I, I saw someone refer to the boomers, the baby boomers, as boom agers. I don't know if I like that term so much, but that's what they're being called. Um, but they're going to inherit $15 trillion in the next 20 years. So what to do with that money, how to invest it, how to donate it, how to give it back, how to pass it along to next generations, all of that's really important, and important decisions will be made over the next 20 to 30 years. And that's where I think media has a great role, to provide analysis, to provide content and information, and sources where people can find this information. 
And by the way, that group, the baby boomers, um, really use social media. Um, in fact, Nielsen reports that younger people sort of gravitate to technology more quickly, but baby boomers take it over <laughs> fast. So that's an interesting one to know about when you're thinking about your options as, as journalists. And it's not just small screens and computer screens, but boomers watch about 174 hours of television a month. Incredible, the amount of media that we're consuming. And that's second only to elders who are at about 205 hours. They also listen to radio, read newspapers, read magazines in great numbers. In short, this is an information savvy and information hungry group. And they need information on investments and retirement planning and how to help pay for their kids' and grandparents' education. At the other age of the spectrum, you have the millennials, who also have a huge need for financial news. Studies are showing that a majority of young people have poor financial literacy skills, and yet this is at a time when they are in a very challenging job market. Today, those people in their 20s carry an average debt load of $45,000. Imagine starting out life. I, I just can't even imagine starting out with that kind of a debt. The average unemployment rate for this group is more than 12% compared to 8% as the nation as a whole. So clearly, this group needs information, clear, objective, understandable personal finance information and content that will be attractive for them to consume. And it has to be attractive. It has to be interesting. It has to be something that they will tune into or log on to or, or read on Facebook. And then, in addition to these personal finance issues, you think of the big issues of our times and the health care costs and the new health care plan and the complexity of that and understanding that. And we've just come off um, years following the mortgage crisis, and it's still with us. And understanding that and what that means for housing prices in the future and what it means for investing um, and some of these new investments that are really complicated and hard to understand and international markets and the impact on our markets and thinking about debt burdens of countries in Europe and then competitiveness in the global world. All of these are tough issues, and in a, an increasingly fractured political world, I believe there's never been a time, a better time, for more straightforward news on economics and the impact on the pocketbook. So those are just a few of the issues that we're facing, but when you think about it, the economy has really been central on the agenda for decades. Well, I began my um, journalism career as an intern reporter with the Miami News, and then I became, my first job was as a broadcast journalist in Salt Lake City. So I think I, <laughs> I was part of convergence to begin with, because I went from knowing nothing about broadcasting, literally, to being working in broadcasting. Um, but in those years, I was very much of a generalist. Uh, I worked for the ABC affiliate in Salt Lake City, and. I like to say my first job was 9 to 5. Unfortunately, it was the wrong 9 to 5. It was 9 <laughs> p.m. to 5 a.m. <laughs> really a bad time of night. And the problem is that in Salt Lake City, from 9 to 5, there's just not a lot of news. I mean, there's crime and there's some fires, but not much. Um, but, you know, even in those days, um, we were able to use the technology, not just reporting, but film and editing and all of that. And they were great skills to learn, and I, I really loved those days because um, I, I was able just to gain so much knowledge about the technology, old technology by today's standards, but how you could use that technology in, in telling your stories. Um, and, it, it, and it was a great time to really learn about a lot of different topics. But it wasn't until several years later that I was able to really focus on one topic that gave me the kind of depth of knowledge and then the confidence to really dig deeper and go beyond what was probably surface reporting in my case. I got that opportunity, as Charles mentioned, in 1978, and I was asked to um, start a, a business program. I was news director at the time with the Miami public station, WPBT, and we started Nightly Business Report as a sort of a 15-minute summary of local and national news, and um, that was in January of 1979, and I had lots of trepidation. I have to say, you know, would I really be able to understand this topic? Yes, I had minored in economics, but this is a big, deep 
topic that's really important. And someone said to me, my cousin, in fact, who, who's an investment banker, said, just, just read the Wall Street Journal. You'll be fine. <laughs> Little did he know. So I did. I read the Wall Street Journal. I tried to read it all the time and, and the business pages of the New York Times in particular. And we had a great business section at the Miami Herald as well. And I talked to people in business news. I got to know them. I talked to professors. I, I just immersed myself in the, in the topic. And the more I learned, the more I found it to be fascinating. And I, one of, as a young journalist, one of my very first interviews was with um, Malcolm Forbes. He used to come down to Fort Lauderdale, and he hosted this, um, this ship or this cruise that would go through the waterways. And I, I said to him, so what makes business news interesting? And he said, because it's like a drama. It's not about numbers. It's about all of mergers and acquisitions and what people are doing. And that's what makes it interesting. And I, I really took those comments to heart, that you really have to make it interesting. And it is about people. And we'll talk about that a little later. But things were so different then. And, and we started this business program literally on a shoestring budget. But because there was a need, and people had not seen business news on television to any extent, and certainly not on a daily basis, it resonated. And people would say to us, well, why can't I get that program when I go back to my home in Chicago or New York? And so we sort of thought, well, we'll see if this could be offered nationally. Uh, I didn't know what I didn't know, and I guess it's a good thing, because it's, it would be very hard to launch a program like that now on public television. But we did. and. In 1981, we uh, emerged on about 125 stations around the country, and um, it's been going ever since, and, and uh, became the most watched daily business news program on television. But things were so different then. I'm, when you think about that time frame, early 80s, it was before CNBC, before Bloomberg, before the internet. The Dow Jones Industrial Average stood at about 800, Gasoline was 86 cents a gallon. A postage stamp was 15 cents. I'm really dating myself here. <laughs> Unemployment was at 6% and inflation was at about 13% and interest rates were spiking. It was just a really tough time and in many ways I almost feel it was a more difficult time than now because you couldn't plan. You never knew where interest rates were going to be. There were no desktop computers, no flashy graphics. We used typewriters. We um, had no smartphones and certainly no mobile apps. But even in those days, we recognized the need for technology. And in a way, we were working in a world of convergence. We just didn't call it that, and we didn't know that we were doing that. Because up until then, business news had really been a print product. It, it, uh, sh shortly before that, the New York Times had started its own special business news section, and I thought that was just terrific. And other magazines, Forbes and Fortune and Business Week, were really doing some great reporting. But here we had television, and you have to illustrate television, and how do you do that? You can't just put text up there, you have to show something. So we literally had to build a database of graphics and um, we, would, we would look at company logos, we, we'd look for things that we, we'd call companies, literally, and go and get their annual reports. Someone talked about um, getting SEC reports. It's also slow to get annual reports and then try to get the logos. It, you, without the internet, you don't realize how difficult it is to get things together. But we did, we developed this database and um, Questions like, how do you show merger and acquisition? That's not a real visual story. But our graphics people figured out how to do it, put logos together, do something in later years, not in the early years, but you can do some animation. How do you show PE ratios? It's still hard. But we were able to do it because we had a belief in it and we, we wanted to make it work. There were a lot of people who said, it will never work. We don't need business news on television. We already have newspapers. I heard that so many times. But we were bound and determined. Um, we were kind of entrepreneurial, and we said, we're going to do it. And really, at the heart of the, this program was the convergence of technology. And, and, and two factors helped us enormously that had nothing to do with what we did, but just happened. So around that time, the news media was moving into satellite distribution. And before that, <coughs> networks had to rely on landlines, and they were very expensive. So it would have been impossible to bring in stories from New York and Chicago. And we had to have those hubs when we started. We couldn't just produce Miami News. It had to be national. 
But the satellite distribution lowered the cost of delivery, and so we were able to bring in the stories from those bureaus and eventually from London and Tokyo. So that was one factor. And I have to say, PBS was great because it was the first. It got into satellite distribution early in the game and helped make that possible. The second area was electronic graphics, um, where we could use those visuals. And that was starting to emerge. And we could make those stories interesting and make them come to life. But when we talk about convergence for business news today, we're talking about a much more complex approach. It's not just the product, it's how we converge the different media, not only to illustrate the story, but to show how people, to work with people and how they receive the story. So you have to optimize um, everything we do. So if you see a graphic, it may exist in beautiful HD resolution, all the way down to online, down to maybe a Twitter post. And, and our graphics people think about that, that you, when you create a logo or you look at a graphic, you have to think about these various different uses. And they all have their own formats. And, it, and it's, there's a lot of back end work that goes into this beyond the writing of a story. And thinking about mobile and on air and online, and it goes on and on. And we at ETV, we have radio as well. So we've got a lot of different outlets to think about. And speaking of radio, there is some fascinating work that's being done right now that I think speaks to convergence in a powerful way. And, it, and it's being done in business news. It's being done in some other areas as well. But one of the areas that I like a lot is planet money. And I'm going to show you some examples because I think it's so much easier to kind of see what people are doing. Planet money is an initiative um, and you may hear this if you listen regularly to NPR, you, you may hear a Planet Money story from time to time. In fact, the other day they had a really great analysis of the new, of the, the new health care plan. Um, but it's a cross-platform initiative. It has a, a very rich website. And recently the team did a story called, What If You Controlled the Economy? And this is a great example of a reporter who's taking what could be a very dull, statistics-laden story and giving it life. David Kastenbaum compares blending of statistics to a snow globe. And so who would think a snow globe and that music? It's just a, a great juxtaposition, a mix of music and sound. And you heard the fades in and out of the sound. It's, it's just wonderfully produced. Um, by the way, um, that was the narration and the interviews you heard. The visuals were added by Craig Ness, who's with ETV, who's joining us today. Um, so you could see some visuals while you were listening along. The audio version of that story aired on NPR at a length of a little over five minutes, but another version lives on the web. You can, you can access it now at about 13 minutes, 56 seconds. So if you really like that story on radio, you have another way of accessing it in, in depth, and, and it's really fun. He, he goes on and on, and he has some great interviews in it. Um, so that's a story that has been extended. Its life has been extended well beyond that one play on the radio. Another example of an interesting format, and this is not business news, but I, I like it because here's, here's someone from traditionally print sources, in this case the New Yorker, who is really working in the audio space in a very interesting way. So Curtis Fox is a podcast producer. That's what he calls himself. He's produced for Parents Magazine, the Poetry Foundation, and the New Yorker. He is really changing the way that we consume print. And I only happened upon him because I did a Google search and I was looking for uh, actually a Ken Aletta story. And instead of reading it, I said, well, I'll just listen to it. And so if you think of both of those examples, Planet Money and Curtis Fox, the Uber podcaster, um, they really show the, the dynamic convergence that we're seeing that is exciting for all of us in the media, whether we're, whether we're teaching, whether we're um, in a primarily print product, or, or we're in broadcast. Convergence really opens the door for collaboration as well. So um, we can work across platforms, but we can also work with many partners. And um, as Charles mentioned, right now, ETV is working with the University of South Carolina um, and the School of Journalism and Mass Communications on a really interesting project. And this would be for a statewide business news online effort. 
and we're still looking to find the resources for this project, but we're developing a prototype for that effort. And the concept is that we will not start with traditional media, we won't start with radio or television, but we will start with an online effort. And out of that, we will build extensions uh, to radio and to television. So in a way, we're kind of flipping the paradigm. Um, so many programs start as a television program or a radio program, and then it's almost an afterthought, oh yeah, we need a website for that. I don't believe that's the way things should be done. I really believe you need to look at the strength of the medium and, uh, and then create around that. And right now, the web is just a terrific way to bring in um, lots of content. So the website that we're developing, we've tentatively called Carolina Money, and um, we have a prototype for it, as I say, and the idea is to produce uh, original business news and then aggregate data and content um, and also emphasize things like mobile platforms. This effort would help us to leverage some of the brands that we already have that we're bringing into ETV and, and pushing out to viewers and listeners like Nightly Business Report, which airs on one of our digital channels here, uh, Marketplace, which airs on ETV Radio, and the South Carolina Business Review, which is a short um, interview segment primarily that airs on ETV Radio. So the idea is we would have beats and uh, everything from financial education to newsmakers to interesting people in the news and um, original content would be refreshed. We would bring in data. Um, one of the things I really like and have seen a lot and, and did when I was with Nightly Business Report is stocks of local interest. We have a lot of companies here uh, that we could profile. So the, the site's editorial voice will be enhanced by user-generated content some, and most importantly by contributions from the USC journalism students. Um, we have already worked and have for many years with the university in internship programs and other programs, and I want to show you one example of something that is running right now on another uh, portal that we have called ETV Shorts, but would be perfect for a site like this and it is from a student from the university. Let's take a look at that. Bill's Music Shop. A lot of the people that come here, this is, uh, this is almost like music church to them. They're here every week because they want to play music, they want to jam, they want to get up on our stage. I manage the, uh, the business. I manage the store. Bill's music shop at Victor Parlor. Uh, I've uh, actually taken it over since my dad has uh, passed away. Told him that I was going to keep it going for him. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, uh, location in, in South Carolina here that is, is it's an institution. Before he makes this place soon, we'll be, we'll be back. We get a rush of people in that want to get up and get on the lineup to get on stage so that uh, they can uh, perform. So that's um, a great example. It was produced by Aaron Mitteke. Uh, for Professor David Weintraub's uh, videography and mass communications class right here at USC. Um, by the way, this student graduated in the spring with a major in visual communications. And the short, as we say, is, is posted on our website. Um, it will also be a great tool for the school, we hope, to use this and other types of segments um, to get students interested in it. I think it also makes business news accessible, that it's not all about um, QE2 or QE3, that there are lots of business stories right in our backyard, right here, of interesting and fascinating people who are, are doing business in the community, and we can showcase them. So our goal for Carolina Money is to have it be a site that is a valuable tool for people within our state and also outside, because South Carolina is um, really becoming a great area for international business. And I learned this, I, I've been here uh, less than two years, but I was just amazed to learn of, of the companies who are based right here in the state. Um, of course, Boeing, you all know, is a big presence um, over in the Charleston area, BMW. Um, we've got 
Continental Tire, a lot of companies that are based here and then feeder companies to those. And having lived in a state that didn't do much in manufacturing, it's fun to be in a state now that, that is making something, that, that there's a lot of manufacturing going on. And what's interesting, and this is another story that I'm going to show you, because it's a story that could be done in a lot of communities, and, it, it, and it's really illustrative of the jobs issues that we have today, where we have this huge unemployment rate, but there are jobs, but there's a gap, and some of that has to do with education. So. If Carolina money were up and running, um, this story would live on the site. We'd have updates. We'd have links, most likely, to workforce development or job sites where people could perhaps um, find out more about their jobs. And um, it would also be on a site with people with like-minded interest. So um, given the right resources, we are very excited about developing Carolina money um, because we think we have the right vehicles to push it out to television and radio as well as online. But you know, if you think about it today, um, really individuals can develop their own websites and you don't have to be a media company, you don't need a printing press, you don't need um, transmitters around the state, you can develop your own um, blog or website or Facebook page and so there's that element too in convergence that the barriers to entry have gone dramatically down and so for us in, in the um, communications business um, we do have to face that competition and I think it's really important that we continually tap into what our viewers, listeners and readers want because they are in fact our customers and that we maintain um, our credibility of content because even though we have a world of tens of thousands of blogs and lots of information, um, a lot of it's opinion. And what we can do is provide fact-based information. And I, I really think this is an important part of, of the media in general, whether it's for local news or national or international. And internationals also and local news are both becoming more and more scarce. But our credibility is, is really our brand, the most important thing we can deliver to our audiences. It's that value proposition um, where people can really trust the information. Because you can go onto a whole lot of websites and really not know the sources of the information or whether it's opinion or was this a press release that looks like a news story. And that's really important for, uh, for us in this day and age to provide that objective kind of information. So, and we also, the other thing I think we have going for us as professional writers, producers, um, there's a level of expectation that is wanted and even demanded in the marketplace. So you may browse on YouTube and find some fun videos. Um, there was a lot of cats and pets and different things like that. But for really solid information, you're going to come back to trusted sources, and, and we're already seeing that happening. So I'm not too worried about the future of, of, um, of business news or general news, because I think there's always going to be that real need for news that has been digested. And in, in, in essence, we have a glut of information, but we need people who are trained who can find the essence of it and make it relevant and make it meaningful to a wide audience. We also need to really respect the medium. Um, and its strength. Some stories don't work as well on television. Um, they're just better suited to print. They're deep thought, analytical stories. They just don't work. You could do a version of it, but it, it doesn't work. Other stories work pretty well on television and um, sometimes work only on television. I'm going to show you, just we'll shorten this one up, Craig, but we'll show a quick interview with um, someone I interviewed back in, I think it was 1993. Jack Welch, who um, many of you know, he was then the CEO of GE. And I show you the story because it's a story that um, you couldn't have really done in print. You had to really see the visual. And I'll just give you a little background. We were doing this interview in Washington, and literally moments before Mr. Welch came into the room to do the interview, our reporter um, had been across the street and said, she had been covering Ted Turner, who was speaking at a conference there, and he had some news. 
and she told me what it was said. So. And when he said, you know, I hope I'm not responding to a rumor, I thought, I hope I'm not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, we went back to the Washington Bureau and checked it out, and sure enough, that had been in the speech. But um, anyway, that's just one of those cases. And, and really, interviewing CEOs, and I, I've done a fair number in my life, um, is really interesting because you can glean some expressions in the way people answer questions. Um, that one was especially um, poignant, but there are, there are other ways that you can ask a question and receive an answer that are just really interesting. I also think it's, it's fascinating in interviews to see what people don't answer, and um, the follow-up is really important, and especially in business news, because it is complicated. So you have a lot in your mind that you have to, to think of when you're coming to an interview like that. So what's the next new thing for Convergence? We've got all these different platforms, and when I think of all of them, I, I think the platform to watch is mobile. The pace of mobile has been nothing short of phenomenal. And I had an opportunity uh, to see this when I worked in the San Francisco Bay Area a couple years ago. Uh, perhaps no other job could have prompted me to leave Nightly Business Report and the program I helped get started than a job that would be located in San Francisco. And you say, why? Well, I, maybe it's because we covered so many technology stories over years, and I just found the whole topic to be fascinating. And what motivates people to do these sorts of things that, where you start up companies like HP and um, Apple Computer and, uh, and then Yahoo and, and Google. And I just wanted to experience it. I thought this would be a great opportunity to live in a community where you have that sort of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit. So I joined um, KQED, which is the public broadcasting station in San Francisco, it's radio and television, in 2007 as chief content officer. And, and what a great, just that name alone, KQED invented that name, and later PBS picked it up, but my predecessor uh, was chief content officer. And what it means, it really speaks to convergence, because you have radio, television, internet, and education all reporting in to content. And that was sort of the idea. So that's because they want these various units to work together, and that's what we all want. But just to put things into perspective of why I think mobile is so important, the month that I started was in January of 2007. And I had an apartment downtown. I was about three or four blocks away from the Moscone Center, if you all know San Francisco. And um, there was an announcement on uh, January 9th um, at Macworld. You know what the announcement was? The iPhone. Steve Jobs announced the iPhone. That was just a short five and a half years ago. And look at where we are now with the iPhone. I mean, this has created a whole new industry. When you think of mobile apps and all of the feeder industries going into the iPhone. Today, Apple Computer has the largest market cap in the United States, outdistancing GM and Microsoft. In 2011, sales of Apple were $128 billion, and I understand that's more than the GDP of a lot of countries. 40% of Apple's revenues are from the iPhone alone. The physical weight of iPhones sold in 2011 equals the weight of the Eiffel Tower. And those are, you know, they're pretty lightweight, but just imagine that. And Barron's Magazine recently pointed out that Apple's market cap at $651 billion is greater than the value of the U.S. stock market in 1977, back to nightly business where we started in 78, than the whole stock market. The S&P was then valued at $623 billion. Here is one company that has been hugely successful and in more recent years fueled by the iPhone. So you can imagine my excitement at living in the Bay Area as a new product like that was being um, released. Although having a husband who <laughs> is an early Apple adopter is not an easy thing when you live so close to the Apple store on Stockton Street. Because <laughs> every time they would introduce a new product, it seemed like it was a lot, um, he would be there, usually first, or ordering online. And the lines around the store, it was just amazing. And, and it would be for weeks. And I'm thinking, why? <laughs> and even with Apple 5, this most recent, I saw in the news that in New York, um, someone paid someone else $1,500 just to wait in line to, to be first on the block to get that Apple 5. So um, 
I really wanted to experience this, this phenomenon. And living in San Francisco, I could really see why an Apple computer got started and why it emerged, because the sense of entrepreneurship in that community is palpable. Lots of people in their late teens and early 20s especially are really riding the boom of entrepreneurship. And I, I think it's really coming back, too. It's gone through that boom and bust. But I have this one story to tell because it sort of vividly reminded me of just how things are there. Um, my apartment was um, one that was fairly new and they were having troubles with the, the fire alarm system. And so one morning at two in the morning, uh, the fire alarm went off. And so all of us and probably hundreds, it's a big apartment, were out there on the street um, with our uh, raincoats because it's cold in San Francisco even in the summer um, over our pajamas and we're all sitting out there with this fire alarm going off and there next to me there's this young man and he's on his his Blackberry or PDA and he's just going and going and going and I finally had to say so what are you doing it's two in the morning <laughs> and he said I have my next round with the VC my second round tomorrow morning and I have to be ready he had not skipped a beat he didn't let the fire alarm, the cold weather, anything stop him. He was that dedicated that he would be working uh, even on the street of San Francisco. And that's sort of the mindset. It's just unbelievable how people will put their, their minds and hearts into a product and a service. And, um, and they've really seen some just incredible growth. That, and you think about Apple Computer, it's changed so many things of what we do, movies, music. Um, it goes on and on. Television is the next area that uh, I think Apple will really be doing some big things in. But mobile is just a great area, and certainly other companies have, have done very well in this space, um, but it's just an exciting area to watch. And at KQED, we used to say we, we sort of lived in a bubble um, in the Bay Area. But really, when you think about it, the Bay Area is not the only place at all for technology. There are great areas for technology, including right here in North Carolina. Um, the Bay Area mindset can really be found anywhere. And if you look at places like Austin, Texas, or the, the corridor in Boston, or the area outside of Washington where AOL emerged, uh, and then you get this host of feeder companies. And, and I find it very interesting because often they are connected with universities. And when you read about the history of Silicon Valley, so much of it has to do with Stanford University. That Canaletta piece I was referring to earlier was all about Stanford and how it helped spawn um, this great education, but also these great businesses. Uh, that come about. So I think what we have here and what I'm sure many of you have in your communities, that combination of the academic, uh, the media, and the technology, it's a powerful collaboration and a powerful uh, way of um, bringing forward new products and new services. And I hope I, I like to think I bring some of that Bay Area mindset back with me um, to ETV because I see huge opportunities for us, especially in the arena of convergence. When you think about mobile apps, that's an industry that's a billion dollar industry that didn't even exist a few years ago. And people are getting into it in all different ways. Um, it's just an exciting time. And mobile apps can be in so many different forms of thinking about games and data delivery and ways to leverage content that you may have on one platform but put it on the small screen. Um, there, I, I think the ideas are just endless of what we can do with mobile. So to recap, we're talking about a world of convergence um, where really today you need to know about audio, video, text, social media, and, and hopefully a specialty skill like business news as well. It is a tall order. We ask a lot of, of young people in particular as, as they're going to journalism school. But I really believe that underlying all of this and the one thread in, in journalism that transcends all of those platforms and all media is good storytelling. And storytelling is the one facet that no matter what platform we use will attract interest. And over the course of 30 years I was with Nightly Business Report, I was fortunate to, to, to cover a few stories. I was ex executive editor, so I couldn't cover a lot. I did a fair number of CEO interviews. But the story that I carry with me um, to this day is not about high finance or trends. 
And I'm going to end um, my remarks with this story because it's very much of a personal story about um, a lady who lived to be 100 years old and served as a role model to anyone who's aspiring to be an entrepreneur. And um, so I'll end it there. Um, I just recall the story of Mrs. B because um, it just goes to show that no matter how far we get out with technology and conversions, uh, no matter how divergent the audience appetites are, um, there are certain elements of journalism that never change. And finding someone like Mrs. B and just telling her story is one of the true joys of, of being part of journalism. Um, the best stories really are about people and not numbers. But we need the numbers, too. So I think that the ability to find those stories and to tell them will, um, will be our future. And uh, it's how we'll make a difference with our audiences in generations to come. I thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share a couple stories with you. Thank you.